Good morning or good afternoon to the many folks that are on with us today. Happy Friday, happy FISMA Fridays. It's hard to believe August is already here. We have a few days ahead of us before the final uh, rules are announced, it so seems. And uh, we're delighted to have our topic for August, uh, which is very appropriate given everything going on, of how to build a FISMA-ready food safety plan. My name is Jill Bender. I will be your host today with safety chain software, and just a few housekeeping tips, as always, before we begin this interactive session. The recording link, as always, will be sent out on Monday. Please, if you have any questions, go ahead and submit them online. Thank you to those who have already pre-submitted questions. We have those queued up and ready to go. As always, for your privacy, everyone's names are confidential, except for the panelists here today. So as always, and I see the numbers keep growing, quite the crowd with us today. And then finally, I should um, say if you are having trouble hearing the audio through your speakers, if you go up to the event info tab in WebEx, you can use the dial-in information. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Today, we have with the Atchison team, um, Dr. David Atchison, good morning. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, everybody. And I understand you are flying solo today. I know your team it keeps expanding and that everyone is off and running. So I'm delighted that will just be you and me today. We'll go ahead and get started. Sounds good. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Let's go ahead and dive in. Yeah, yeah, we always start with what's the latest update on FISMA. And I know that uh, certainly there will be something very soon here. No, exactly. Um, well, the latest update is we're still waiting, as you, as you said. Um, just to remind everybody, due date for these um, proposed rules on preventive controls, and that we're talking here about for human foods and animal foods, is August 30th. So Saturday um, is what I'm expecting. But um, just, just so some of the intel that I've, that I've picked up is what I'm hearing is that um, I'm not hearing that there's been major major problems or major challenges, I, I, I'm personally anticipating that we might see something in the Federal Register over the weekend, um, and then these rules will be out for review on, I think, early next week is, is what I'm predicting. Um, but you never know. You never know until, until they're out there. But um, other than that, everything seems on, on track um, for, these, for these two on preventive controls, and that's really a little bit what we're going to focus on today is, um, is exactly what do we do when they come out in terms of building food safety plans. Okay, excellent. And I think um, we were sort of chatting beforehand to the audience here as far as, you know, when the rules come out, it's going to be hefty reading for the, the Atchison Group team, right? Yeah, no, exactly. Right, right. I, I think we'll have, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of pages, but it'll be a lot. Perfect, excellent. Well, let's go ahead and move to our first question that really does focus on, as you were talking about, and getting prepared. If you could just chat a little bit about what's the philosophy behind a FISMA food safety plan. Yeah, absolutely, Jill. I think this this is fundamental to if we go back to some of the conversations we've had around FISMA and the preventive control rules is what is it that the agency is trying to achieve with these rules? Um, and I've said this before, but I don't think it hurts repeating, is I, I see this as they're expecting food companies who are registered with FDA. And let's just sort of remind everybody that that um, with a few exceptions, if you're juice, HACCP, seafood HACCP, or your low acid canned foods with regard to micro, at least that's what's in the proposed rules, and, and I don't see it changing a whole lot, then you are exempt from doing these food safety plans. But everybody else who is a registered firm will, will have to pay attention to this. Um, and it doesn't matter where you are on the globe. If you are manufacturing, uh, processing, packing, or holding food, it's going to enter interstate commerce in the United States, you'll have to have a food safety plan, with those exceptions around milk and juice, et cetera. The philosophy here is to get us all to think about prevention. Uh, they, want, they want food companies to look at risks with regard to food safety in a more holistic way. And we'll get into this in a, in a minute, but um, my read of this is if FDA wanted to say everybody has to have a HACCP plan, they would have mandated HACCP across the board, and they haven't done that. What they've basically said is think about risks. Think about risks in your ingredients, in your suppliers, in your processing, in your environment, 
basically anywhere in the system and, and identify those risks and build a plan known as the food safety plan to control those risks. So the philosophy around this is really, again, as I've said numerous times, is taking a HACCP plan and elevating it to a more holistic preventive control strategy. And I think the key for many people, which we're going to get into in, in, in a minute, is so how do I actually do that? I've got a HACCP plan. I've got programs. What, what do I need to do different to be compliant? Um, so fundamentally, the philosophy here is think prevention and think beyond HACCP. Great. And I know that's sort of a theme that we've been talking about and certainly resonates with this audience for, for months and I think almost a year or so since we've been talking about this on Friday. So let's go ahead and jump on to the next question um, that came in. I have a HACCP plan. Is this good enough? And you, you just touched on that. So, and I, I do love this sort of is, is HARP seed just HACCP spelled wrong? And, you know, certainly we can talk about that. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I, I, I think as I was just trying to say, the, the point about I have a HACCP plan, is it enough? And my view of it is it really isn't enough. Um, but it's a fantastic start. It, it, nobody who's got a HACCP plan should throw it out and say, oh, this is, this is worthless now. It's, it's, it's not going to help me. It absolutely is um, because it's a risk-based preventive strategic plan. That's, that's what HACCP is all about. Um, and, and as I was saying in my earlier comments, is the harp C philosophy, if we just think about what the words are, is hazard analysis, risk-based preventive controls. So the goal here is to think about, um, think about the hazards across the board. Um, it, it is, as we're going to get into in a second, it is what are, what are the hazards in my supply chain? What are the hazards within my facility? And it's not just the processing hazards that are classically controlled by HACCP. It is things like the environmental programs, especially if you're making ready-to-eat foods. Um, so it, it, it's, it's going beyond the, the conventional hazard analysis critical control points. I think another, another fact that I want to mention here is that there's no expectation that I'm aware of that the, the FDA expects us to put critical control points in all kinds of new places. That's, again, that's not what it's about. Um, it's about understanding where your risks are and what's my preventive control to manage that risk. And it's, um, so it is, this, it is this shift from a critical control point based, very definitive, scientifically um, justifiable strategy that is really very, I think, very prescriptive to a slightly more squishy, yeah, we need to look at the hazards from one end to the other, determine what our preventive control is, and, and put it in place and monitor it and make sure that it's working. So it's, it's, it's very much not just HACCP spelled wrong. It is fundamentally a different philosophy and a different approach, but it's, it's heavily, heavily premised on the HACCP principles of analyzing hazards and looking for ways to control them. Um, so I think it's, as, I, as I'm saying, and we'll get into again in, in, in a little bit later, is, is the question people say, well, I've got a HACCP plan. What do I do with it? And we'll get to that in a bit. So, um, so that's my thinking on this one, Jill. Okay, great. And it sounds like, again, that the HACCP plan really is a strong foundation. And as you were talking about with, you know, yeah. harp uh, you know, the holistic approach, um, that just that I hear that, and I'm sure that just resonates well with everyone. Next question is, what are the key elements of a food safety plan? Right. Well, again, <laughs> we're working we're working off the off the proposed rule here, Jill. Um, right. And the and I don't I don't think this is going to change. But the way I think of this is is there are several key elements, and I think the first point to mention is there is this expectation that your food safety plan will be put together by a qualified individual. And um, let's just touch on that for a second. Is this, this person is somebody who's knowledgeable in food safety, either through training or through experience. And we've got more insights as to what that means, and um, there are training programs that I know have now been developed. They're coming online, and I think within the next week or two, we're going to start to see these come out. 
um, and out of the Preventive Controls Alliance. So we will we will have a very, I think, clear idea of what it takes to be a qualified individual. So a qualified individual is going to build our plan or be responsible for it. And it starts with analyzing all the potential hazards that could be in your foods. Um, and you need to think about this for product lines. So if you've got two or three different, completely different product lines, and you're making, say, you're making 20 different SKUs on each line, there's no expectation that you're going to have 20 food safety plans for every SKU, not at all. But if you're making two very different products with different risks in, in your facility, there is an expectation that you would, have, you would have a food safety plan that speaks to a particular type of product. So two very different products, you'd have to have two food safety plans, but the principles are the same. So we're starting with what are all the potential hazards? And we have to remember that we need to think about micro, chemical, physical, and the FDA has rolled radiological into the chemical. So we're thinking about all of those. We then ask the question, out of those potential hazards, which ones would we deem to be significant? And the FDA has not yet really defined significant, but what they've, what they've said is significant means to somebody who's knowledgeable in the field, and this is our qualified individual, that's why they have to know what they're doing. So would this knowledgeable person see this as a hazard that they would want to control to protect the public? And if the answer is to that is yes, then, then there needs to be a preventive control in place to control that risk. Um, so this is based on experience, it's based on past history of your products, of other people's products that are, that are similar in terms of deeming whether the potential risk that you've identified is a significant risk. So now we have a list of significant risks and the next step is what's the control in place to, to control that risk? Is it a processing step? Is it supply chain control? Is it a testing program? The FDA doesn't mind how you do it, but you need to have a preventive control strategy to manage and control that significant risk. And you have to monitor on an ongoing basis that your control is working. So that might be through measuring a parameter in a process, a temperature or a belt speed or something, um, very similar to critical control points. <clears throat> so your whole asset plan is not wasted here. Um, or it may be monitoring something in the environment. It may be testing product. <clears throat> so that's the monitoring piece. The next part is the agency expects us to have corrected actions and to figure out what those are or what they may be before we need them. Put those in your food safety plan. We then have to have a verification process whereby our qualified individual is overseeing the plan, tracking it, making sure it's all working, um, and maintaining those records. Periodically, once every three years at a minimum, you need to reanalyze everything. Are we still where we should be? Um, any new significant risks? Any changes? And then if there's something like you've decided you're going to establish a new product line, um, before the three years is up, you'd need, obviously, to create a new food safety plan. So think about this as a um, essentially a, a, a story, if you like, or a narrative that you are going to create that speaks to how you've assessed the risks, how you've determined which is significant, how you're controlling those risks, how you're monitoring those, those controls, what your corrective actions are, um, and how you're verifying the system is, is ongoing. So that when the, when the FDA shows up at your facility, they will have the authority, assuming these rules come out next week, this time next year, they will have the authority to, to come into your plant if you're a big producer and say, show me your food safety plan. And, and everybody needs to be ready with, with, okay, what are we going to do when we get asked that question? And a very big part of the food safety plan isn't just writing it and popping it on a shelf. It is about ongoing tracking of all of these preventive controls so the agency will get the sense that not only do you understand the harp C principles uh, that you're able to show an inspector, yeah, look, here's what we're, here's how we're managing it. Here's the, here's the challenges we've had. Here's some corrective actions that have popped up. Here's how we've managed them. Um, and, and it's all documented. 
So it's, it's a little, in, way, in many ways, it's simple. It's telling a story of how we're managing these risks. And the, de the devil is in the details of, of how you actually put that together and, and fundamentally link it into the programs you've already got. So long, long answer, um, Jill, but it's, it is, it's probably the fundamental question here, and it's, it is complicated. Right. I would think that we could just do a two-hour session just, just on this piece, but I really liked how you, you outlined that. And as a follow-up, I think it would, it's, um, on our side, we'll just sort of put these maybe in a blog or something, sort of the top ten items that you just mentioned um, and re reference back to this recording. That was a really helpful answer there. Let me go ahead and jump into the next question here and talking more specifically about um, environmental monitoring and supply chain risk control and how that fits into the food safety plan. And again, I know you, you sort of touched on that already. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, for, for, those, for those who've been regular attenders for FIS FISMA Friday, you, you know we've talked about environmental monitoring and supply chain risk control many times. Um, and just to remind everybody, the, um, the FDA was given the authority um, in the statute in 2011 to, to require environmental monitoring programs and to require supply chain controls. And the first round of the proposed rules did not have that in there, um, I think for economic reasons, but, but the reproposals did. And, and I have every reason to believe that they will be in the final rules. So we, we, we should assume that we'll have something on environmental monitoring. Basically, what this is saying, just to remind everybody, is that if you are manufacturing a ready-to-eat food um, that, that's part of the food safety plan um, requirements, and there we're, I'm saying it's not juice and it's not, it's not um, seafood, so any other, anything other than that, you're manufacturing a ready-to-eat food that is exposed to the environment after it's been processed and before it's been packaged, then there is an expectation that unless that food has a subsequent kill step once it's in the package, that you have an environmental monitoring program. This, that in a nutshell is what, is what needs to be part of your environmental monitoring program of your food safety plan. We, could, we, we can and we have and we will do whole webinars on so how do we do this? What does a good environmental monitoring program look like? So there will be more to come on that. On the supply chain part, the FDA is saying, think about the hazards in your suppliers. And there is an expectation that you, you kind of go through the same thought process with your, your suppliers and your ingredients as I've just outlined for your food safety plan. Look at all your suppliers and ingredients and ask yourself, do any of those pose a significant hazard? And if the answer is yes, they do, then you've got to have something documented as how that hazard is being controlled. You may be controlling it yourself because you're receiving an ingredient that could have salmonella in it, but you're cooking that ingredient, so you're controlling that hazard. You may be using that ingredient um, in a finished product, and you're not cooking it, so the supplier is controlling the hazard. That needs to be documented into your food safety plan supplier control part. So our food safety plan is speaking to a lot about what are we doing internally with our processes, and our environmental monitoring program, and our supply chain uh, risk control program. And again, we'll have a lot more to say about that once the final rules come out. And we'll be doing webinars and helping people understand, so how do I actually build this supply chain control program that will, that will be compliant? And we mustn't forget allergens either. That also falls into your, into your food safety plan. We have, to, we have to control those as well. So that's a bit on environmental and supply chain, Jill. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and take us then to the next question. Um, I have most of the material that I need for a FISMA food safety plan, but it isn't all in one plan today. Do I need to rewrite everything? Right. This, <laughs> this is a question that, that we often get asked, and the simple answer to me is no. Um, there's no expectation that we have to throw it all out and redo it all. Um, I, you know, if, if if I was to poll everybody who's on this call who's working in a in a manufacturing or processing environment, um, a food plant that's going to have to be compliant with this, they're likely going to tell me, well, yes, we've got environmental monitoring programs, we've got allergen control programs, we have a supply chain control program, we have a HACCP plan, we have GMPs, we've got all sorts of prerequisite programs. 
they're all separate policies, procedures, um, and they're all in our in our in our book. We've got them all laid out, and they're and they're all good. Um, the 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 key part to that is so what 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 do I do with with that um, with with all these documents? And I, I my approach to this is think back to what are you going to do when the FDA inspector shows up at your plant and says, show me your food safety plan. And I think the wrong thing to do will be to go and get 25 binders of your different programs and dump them on a table and say, here you go. Here it is. Um, what, what I think the strategy is would be to develop a narrative, to develop a summary that, that allows the inspector to see that you understand harp C, you understand the regulatory requirements, you can put it together as a story, as I call it. I mean, it's just a simple way, I think, to, to look at this, where you've laid out the components of your food safety plan. But, but, but you're referring through an addendum and a, an appendix to say, for supply chain control program, see file 23, because that outlines that whole part of the program. So my, my view of this, and we'll see, we'll see where the FDA comes out with guidance and, and other suggestions on this one, but my view of it is, Leverage everything you've got, but think about creating a, a narrative, this story as I call it, that, that stitches it all together and, and gives that FDA inspector the sense when they walk in there that you really have got this. You do understand it and that you've got all, the, all your programs in place. So we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're not rewriting everything, but I think we've got to do something that allows the, the FDA to see that we've, that we've got it and that we've upped our game to a harp c based thinking rather than HACCP, um, and we can present it in a coherent way. Um, so so that's, that's the way I, I see this, um, which is why I don't think we need to rewrite everything, but we do need to create something that, as I say, stitches it all together in some sort of a narrative. Um, and then, then I think that'll work. Well, it's, it's the presentation and the proof, right, of, of that that you um, that things are, yeah. are working the way they should, right? No, right. no, it, it 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 is, it is, and it's um, you know, we're we're needing to convey to the FDA that we know what we're doing, and um, I think there's there's relatively simple ways to do that by just putting it together in a way that that tracks with the components of of a food safety plan that, that I laid out. And, and the earlier question. Okay, great, thank you. I think this might be the last pre-submitted one and then we'll go ahead and, and take some of the questions that have been coming in. Let me confirm that. Um, will, what will FDA expect in terms of documentation? Um, what records should I keep? What will FB, FDA be able to see on routine inspections was the question. Yeah, um, and this is the fundamental Proving to the agency that you that you get it. That's, so really, everything we've been talking about in in terms of the fundamentals of the food safety plan, the environmental monitoring program, the supply chain, we need to put that together in in a document. Um, and it's exactly as the way that we that I was just talking about in response to the last question. Um, so we built our plan. We need the records show that on an ongoing basis, we are doing the monitoring, we, we're maintaining our record of corrected actions, something goes wrong, we fix it, we take the corrected action, we document it so that it's, it's all there. The, basically, the way FDA is approaching this right now, I don't think it will change, is their expectation is that you have at least two years of records that they can look at. Um, at least six months of these records needs to be available on site. And to me, that means that it could be available electronically on site. They just have to be able to get it when they show up to do an inspection. Um, I don't think it's going to work to say, well, all of our food safety plans are kept to corporate. I don't have any, any in the plant. It's not likely, but, but that's not going to fly with the, with the agency. So we need to document all of these programs that we're talking about. A, a difference that, that FISMA will kick in is when the FDA arrives to do a routine inspection, 
And I'm talking here about not a four-cause inspection. It's not like your product's been linked to illness or they found a problem with it. This is the routine inspection. They will have the authority to say, show me your food safety plan and show me that it's working. So they will, they will have access to all of these monitoring records. Right now, they don't. They don't have access to that unless, it's, unless there's a reason. There has to be a cause, um, a reasonable probability of a serious adverse health event is what triggers their, their ability to look at your testing records and other processing records. Um, now, a lot of, uh, that question is often asked of food companies, show me your testing records, and many companies will just show them to FDA because they've got nothing to hide. Other companies are like, no, we, we don't want you to see what we're doing. Um, that will change with CISMA because if you're testing to show that something you're doing, it's, it's a testing program for part, as part of your food safety plan, like your environmental monitoring program, I believe the FDA is going to be able to see those records on a routine inspection, and that will be a difference. I think time will will make make this clearer in terms of exactly what they're what they're asking for. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some legal challenges on some of this, but um, based on the statute and based on the proposed rules, that's the way it's shaping out right now. Um, and we'll see what the if the final rules change that, but I, I don't think they will, because FDA really does want to come in and say, do you get it? Do you have the programs in place? And, and are you executing on those programs? Um, and then one final thought on that, Jill, is that um, I'm anticipating, <clears throat> and I've heard a number of people share the same thought, that the FDA inspectors will have done their homework before they show up to your plant. So mm -hmm. I think we're going to see. Uh, I think we're going to see FDA inspectors coming into a plant that makes a given type of product, and they're going to be more informed about the general risks that they need to look for. So they may start to ask some pretty targeted questions um, around risk control for a specific products. So I, I think we're going to. It's not going to be overnight by any means. This is this is going to be a five to ten year journey, um, and we're all going to learn on the way. But um, right now. You will have to have those records, and FDA will be able to look at them as part of a routine inspection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. That, that's interesting. That's when the, the difference with the routine inspections. I, I know you touched on that before. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and do this. I know there's a lot of information that was uh, distilled here today. We are at the bottom of the hour. We'll try to stay on for about five or ten minutes to address some of these questions that have come in. You can continue to put questions in. If we don't get to them, we'll save them for next time. As a few more questions come in, I'm just going to say just a few quick things about Safety Chain, um, the sponsor here today. It really comes down to us helping you with FISMA compliance, and that's what our customers tell us. Um, we talked a lot today about showing the plan and showing that's working, and that's a huge part of what automation can do for you, from comprehensive supplier compliance and supply chain controls and automating that and documenting that and making sure that your scheduling, monitoring, validation, all plan components are taking place, as well as capital generation and central repository documentation to help with that audit readiness and continuous improvement. And then also uh, we do tie in the GFSI um, automation too, which closely maps to FISMA as well. So that is just the quick take on safety chain, and we're, we're absolutely happy to um, answer any further questions about that offline. But let's go ahead and jump into our questions. We have quite a few, and I'm going to just start firing away at you, if you don't mind, and uh, we'll get going. Now, a few of these pre-submitted questions. One, we didn't, we, we didn't talk about this today, but I think this is just a, a quick question, to, uh, hopefully a quick question to ask in regards to traceability. Specifically, mm -hmm. this person has co-manufacturer that manufactures products, and we open the bulk, and they repack in-house. And the yep. question is, has it, is that we will need to track down to the packaging material from the supplier to the consumer, and is that true? Um. <clears throat> If I'm understanding, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just the reason I'm, I'm pausing on that is it, it relates to packaging material as opposed right. to what's in the package. Absolutely, what's in the package? Yes, one up, one back. That FISMA hasn't changed that. It's the same as the Bioterrorism Act. There is an expectation of packaging material that we understand the risks in it, 
especially if it's food contact, well, if it's food contact packaging, basically. Um, and the, I would, uh, my default would be without going and checking specifically what it says in the regs, is, is yes, it, you would need to understand because it's food contact, one up, one back on the packaging materials, and which actually makes a, um, to me, makes a ton of sense anyway, because if you have a packaging problem, you are going to want to be able to figure out, well, who received the bad packaging. So um, I think, um, I, yeah, I, I would say traceability on packaging materials. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next question. That's in this reference to a little bit of, again, we're talking about with inspections coming up and compliance. Um, this specifically was talking about once the final rules are issued and, and companies based on their size have one to three years for compliance, what is an acceptable response to an inspector asking for documents and information that is not required to be provided yet because of the compliance date? So um, if well, let me let me let me try to sort of answer that or try to pass it in a slightly different way. If the question is around um, between now and the date of compliance, the, nothing changes. Um, access to information, access to records is based on four cores. FISMA did change that and changed it to reasonable probability of a serious adverse health event. Once, once the compliant dates hit, and let's assume that it is one year for big, two years for small, and three years for very small, um, once those hit, then the inspectors will be able to ask for the types of records we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> they will not be able to ask for for information regarding recipes or finances or personnel records, um, but they will get they they will be able to get pretty much everything and anything else, um, and that's um, if, if that's answering the question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of when they're going to have access and what they will have access to. Okay, great. And I think there'll be the more on this as, as the final rules come out too, as far as guidance, I would assume. Um, another question. Yeah, I think I, I, th yeah, I was just going to say. I think yes. I think that's that's got a lot of people nervous. Is what are they going to be able to to look at? And I think once we get these final rules. That that's just going to be something that that I'm going to focus on and and really figure out what authorities the agency has in terms of what they can get at because right now it, it is a little vague. I just made that note too. That that in itself might be a good next as my Friday's topic, or at least in a few months from now, once things have been deciphered. Um, great. Right. Let me just grab maybe one more or two more questions here. More have come in, but. Um, Basically, uh, this one's um, just in reference of a food safety plan, the same thing as a risk register. I think it's the terminology that was thrown out there. So is the food safety plan the same thing as a risk register was the question? Um, I don't think so. I think a food safety plan is a much more comprehensive thought process than a risk register. And that might be my lack of full understanding of what a risk register is. Um, but but the a food safety plan is going to need, I think, uh, to speak much more holistically to um, validation of preventive controls, the verification that the system's working, um, ongoing monitoring, and the corrective actions. So I think it's I think it's more than just a risk register. That's that's my view of it. It it, it requires a, a more holistic thought process of overall strategic. Um, hazard-based risk analysis and, and preventive control management. And again, going through the uh, the holistic approach um, that you're referring to. Okay, let me just grab one more question, and we'll wrap it up and keep a lot of these questions for next time. And I know you talked in environmental monitoring and how we'll, we'll expand upon that, and there'll be lots of resources readily available. But this was one specifically asking, should you focus environmental monitoring in the area after the kill step or throughout the plant? After the kill step. Now let's let's differentiate let's differentiate here between an environmental monitoring program that is a best in class program with an environmental program monitoring program that will meet regulatory requirements. And um it's a fundamental philosophy of mine is that I see regulatory compliance as a baseline. 
it rarely is is regulatory compliance built off um, ultimate best in class. It's usually good, um, but there's always options to to go better or, or best in class. And a robust environmental monitoring program absolutely is looking at areas leading into ready to eat areas. I mean, if you think of the classic zoning, one, two, three, four, you get into zone fours and some zone threes even, you may not be in your ready to eat area, you may be just outside it. Um, to me, a good program is looking at, at those areas of zone four, zone threes. Um, but the FDA is focus is is exclusively on that ready to eat area. Um, but again, when an inspector comes in and says, "Tell me how you're 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 monitoring your environment um, in your ready to eat area," it, it's going to serve you very well to lay out a robust program that's looking at environmental monitoring across the whole. Or the whole scheme as a best in class kind of approach it's going to it's going to protect your brand best which is the end of the day is is critical um and it'll meet it'll meet regulatory compliance if you're thinking well do i need to establish lots of environmental monitoring and swabs in my raw area to be compliant with fda i think the answer to that is no and i'd be shocked if you got a 483 for not doing that um and mm -hmm. if you do get a 483 i'd want to push push back hard on them and say, yeah, you know, that's not the intent of this, this rule at all. It's, um, it's, so so if, if, if that's kind of the general direction of the question, is build yourself a good program that's going to protect the brand and you'll be in good shape. But don't be swabbing the heck out of your raw area because you think FDA is going to need you to do it. That's not my read on the rule at all. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and I think... Um, Again, all these questions are really good and we'll continue to sort of build the dialogue as we go the next few months here. I am just going to wrap up with a few. And Dave, if you don't mind, Dave, I can throw just one last question as we wrap up here. A couple questions did come in, and I know you've stated this in the past, but just sort of a, a, a thought on this again as far as GFSI aligning with FISMA. And, um, you know, I'll put a little call out there that, you know, we'll go ahead and answer that and then we'll kind of wrap it up and we'll go from there. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, as I'm sure many on the on the call are aware, is is we've spent time looking at, at doing comparative analysis between the preventive control rules and some of the GFSI schemes, particularly um, FSSC and um, and SQF, um, and they aligned extremely well. Um, and, and and our view of that alignment was, if you are SQF or FSSC and some of the other ones we've also looked at, you're in good shape. You're not perfect. There's a few gaps. There's a few holes. Um, and, and I think um, I don't think that's going to change a whole lot. Um, but there is obviously we'll need to relook at that question when we get the final rules and say, has anything changed? Where are the gaps? But I do see GFSI as a very good foundation for being compliant with CISA. Um It's not completely aligned. GFSI does not build you the type of food safety plan that we've that we've talked about, but it sure as hell builds you all the components that you'll need um, and puts you in a very good place to create that story, as I keep referring to it, so that, that, that you have a happy FDA inspector when they show up and say, mm -hmm. show me your food safety plan, and you sit down and you say, well, Mr. Inspector or Miss Inspector, let me tell you my story, and, 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 and here's my food safety plan, and they leave, the, leave, they leave your facility with a big smile feeling like this, this facility really gets it. They're good. It's such a great visual when you keep saying that there's a big smile and narrative. I love it. It's great. <laughs> uh, with, well, let me just add one more thing with the GFSI um, as I was starting to go there with um, Safety Chain is going to be um, talking with the GFSI scheme a series um, this year starting end of September, which really specifically talks about the GFSI alignment with FISMA, and it's the scheme leaders, um, specifically with the SQF, BRC, and FSSC, that will be talking about the alignment, but they're also talking about the gaps, because obviously the schemes have also done and continue to do their own analysis as well. So for those that are very interested in this topic, I encourage you to sign up for that series. It kicks off, um, it starts at the end of September. As always, we have tons of other resources between the Atchison Group and Safety Chain. I think 
hopefully we've got you somewhat covered on the FISMA compliance, at least information exchange for sure. Um, we do appreciate everyone's participation in today's FISMA Fridays. Again, uh, lots of questions came in. We will document them and um, bring more up for the next month's topic. The, Sessions coming up might switch based on what's most relevant coming out, but right now we do have a schedule posted out there, and we thank everyone for your participation. David, I know you're racing off to go catch a flight. Thank you so much for a very informative session, as always. Yeah, oh, great pleasure. You know, um, wishing everybody a happy weekend, and look forward to lots and lots of reading next week. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Happy, uh, happy Fisma Fridays.